In today's world, we are increasingly dependent on technology. Our business and personal lives rely on it, but as you've probably noticed, it's unreliable. They promise it'll get better, but it usually gets worse. Our computers are slow, so we end up squinting at smartphones and tablets. We live in constant fear that something's going to happen to our personal data. So we're scared into paying for fake protection that proves useless when disaster strikes. Update attacks, fake Wi-Fi, cloud control, and other industry scandals are designed to keep the money flowing. The jokers we pay to fix our stuff have no clue what they're doing, so they do a virus scan and then wipe out our precious photos. Intelligent, successful people feel intimidated by the chaos and think it's somehow their fault. If they only knew what the industry was doing to them, they'd get torches and pitchforks. If only we had someone to explain it all in plain English so we can start protecting ourselves. Oh wait, we do! It's the Computer Exorcist Podcast with your host, Mark Anthony Arena. From the Wallace Memorial microphone in my home office, overlooking the can of worms in downtown Rochester, New York, this is the Computer Exorcist Podcast. My name is Mark Anthony Arena. I am so glad you are joining me today. It's funny, folks. I keep promising you more episodes where it's just uh, solo teaching episodes, but then I bring on more special guests instead because the special guests keep coming. So, today's special guest is Janet Gervers. How are you? Hi, Mark. I'm great. Glad to be on your show. Thanks for the invite. Yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, today we're celebrating 3,000 downloads since the show started, so I'm pretty excited about that. Congratulations. That's nice. amazing. And and they aren't, you know, a lot of companies will go on Facebook, and you might know this, where they'll buy fake likes, right? They'll just hire someone to do a bunch. These are all real fans, real people downloading the show, and they love the show, and I, I appreciate them. So, yeah, we're happy about that. Also, um, my business name has changed after about 15 years. Uh, I'm no longer Technosophy. So when I answer my phone, it's very weird now. After 15 years, I don't say technosophy. I am now the Computer Exorcist LLC, which is a lot simpler and goes along with the show, and nobody in the world could pronounce technosophy. It's more memorable. Yeah, it's it's the like imagery it. is there, and technosophy meant technical wisdom, but this is just, you know, it's simple message, imagery. All this stuff is possessed, right? And I always start every speech with... Raise your hand if you hate technology, right? And and as as you if you folks were here uh, a few minutes ago, Janet and I spent a good 10, 15 minutes just fighting with the technology to get this thing up and running today. So we won. <laughs> I we like that. Say. We won. Yeah, yeah, we knocked it out. We won. So yeah, at least. At least for now, right? <laughs> for now. It'll work for now. We'll see what happens. Um, so thanks for being on the Computer Exorcist podcast. Um, what I'll do is I'm going to talk about you. I want to hear all about you. And then I'm going to read an article and get your opinion. And the whole point of the podcast is we talk about how technology is often a false promise, right? It's 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 offered as a panacea, right? Oh, yeah, technology's going to solve everything. And every article you read, oh, technology's going to fix everything. But in the reality, here we are battling with it, and, and there's nothing fundamentally works. Um, and if, you, if you're bored, you can check out the book Why Software Sucks. It was written by David Platt in 2007, and it's increasingly relevant. And he talks about how computer programmers, instead of fixing fundamental flaws... Every week, they just add billions and billions and billions more features because it's a lot easier than fixing something f fundamental, right? Actually, my brother is currently in my basement right now fixing a foundation issue. <laughs> and oh he could have said to me, if he was a computer program, he would have said, Mark, oh, forget about the foundation. Let's just keep adding things to the roof. How's that? Um, so tell us about you, Janet. Uh, where are you from and who are you? Okay. I'm Janet Gervers. 
from JAG Media. I am from Cincinnati, Ohio, originally. Spent oh. half my life there. The other half in California. I'm in Santa Monica. And i uh, got to say, I love being in California. This half of my life has been much better for me. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah. Creativity is my superpower. And JAG Media is where imagination creates transformation. And what that's all about is that I'm a designer with an artist's eye, actually two artist's eyes, <laughs> bringing it a unique perspective so that my clients stand out from the crowd. And what that is, it's transformational design that authentically communicates how my clients serve others and attracts their target audience. They end up with the online presence of their dreams, which that translates to things like websites, branding, logos, and so forth. Yeah, it's... So that's uh... not so. Yeah, I, I'm all about differentiation, right? Every episode of my show and every day, that's all I talk about. Other guys are jokers. They're doing virus scans like it's 1981. I'm totally different, right? And it's it's my challenge to figure out how to come across as totally different, right? People are shocked because I've actually remained in business for more than a week, unlike most of these dudes who just vanish. It's like, well, my last guy vanished, so I'm just afraid you're going to... No, I'm not going anywhere. Um, so yeah, differentiation is huge. Um, how do you, and I love the other part, by the way, of, of imagine what you want in life. Cause I'm big on that. And, and it, it's definitely difficult to do. It's, it's not easy for me to just, just focus on, okay, look, this is how I want my life to be, but absolutely you imagine what you want your life to be. And then you go toward it and you transform your life. So how do you achieve the differentiation and the transformation? It's well, it's taken a while really to arrive at that and just hone that uh, not only the messaging in, but who I am working with as clients. And just I'll talk about the clients first. They tend to be women entrepreneurs who are coach, author, speakers. And guess what, Mark? They hate technology for sure. And mm. one of the things about me is besides being a designer, I'm also. I'm pretty tech savvy. I don't hate technology. Doesn't mean I haven't ever had problems with it. However, when I started designing websites, and this was after I went to college, which was for graphic design, and the web wasn't really quite there yet. And after I moved to California, starting out in San Francisco, I had I had literally heard about the web right before I moved, uh, and I was just like. I want to be a website designer. I actually had no idea what it was, but I knew that I wanted hmm. that. So I moved to San Francisco This and, uh, and it was late in 94. And by 95, within six months, I was designing websites. <laughs> wow. uh, so that's happened. I've seen a ton of changes in the industry happen. I've had my own company since 2000 so speaking of being in business for a while and some of my clients have said similar things to you where they had a website designer that just that left them high and dry or they just they went away and didn't say anything so um some of those things have happened and and again they hate the technology side what i do is unlike a lot of other designers out there, and I know because my clients tell me about them, I actually talk to my clients. I communicate with them. I find out what are your long-term and short-term goals. Um, even things like one of my clients who's a uh, coach, author, speaker, Sherry, she is great. I designed her entire brand for her and we had fun just on the Zoom. I was looking at some clothes that she was wearing and her jewelry and stuff. And I'm like, wow, you know what? You look really good in teal. And I've seen you in this orange jacket that looks awesome. And these, this is your color palette. And she's like, yeah, this is great. And we had fun doing that. And once we had her whole, you know, the logo, the website, her, you know, Facebook page, et cetera, people come to her website and they're like, that is you, Sherry. And so it really authentically communicates who she is as a person and a coach, author, speaker. And I really just, I love doing that. I'm pretty intuitive when it comes to things like color palettes and what is going to um, look good. 
for my client, but it's really a lot of it is just getting to know who that person is and communicating. And since things have changed so drastically since I started the business back then, it was a handful of designers. And, uh, you know, I quickly learned that if I was going to create websites that I liked that looked good, I was going to have to learn the tech side. So I did learn back then HTML and how to do coding and all that good stuff. So that has really helped me along the way, both in the corporate world, as well as, and more importantly, with my clients. So I can serve them and just do do it all. I can, you know, set up their web hosting, buy their domain name and all of that stuff for them. So it works seamlessly for them and they don't have to have uh, any of those tech headaches or we'll just say it minimizes. Sure. Tech headaches, but handling, but... having someone you can trust, right? That's the whole thing with my business. It's difficult to find people I can trust to do this. But when I do find someone I trust, oh, forget it. You know, I'm, I'll mail them flowers. Like I'm so thrilled to to have people I trust. It's interesting how you've got the design element where you know about the colors and the graphic design, but you're also doing the tech side. That's really different. Um, And yeah, I I had a client one time and she had this crazy hairdo and someone made a website for her and they, it worked really well. Like they made a website and it really, it featured like her face and the hairdo and everything and it just worked so well. So that was, yeah, yeah. That's good how you, you actually, like you said, authentically communicate who that person is and show make their uniqueness apparent on their website. Yeah, well, well, thanks for saying that. Yeah, because I um, there was another coach that I worked with. Uh, let's see, this was last year, and uh, you know, when I talked to her, I was just like, I don't know what you do. When I look at your website, I was just being honest with her. She was someone I'd already met in person i'd done some work on her um created an email newsletter for her and i was like you know angela i just i don't really know what you do by looking at your website and she's like yeah i know so Uh i created a new one and while she is a coach you knew her but you still from her website couldn't garner what she did that's yeah yeah i mean she's not someone that i knew well i met her from a business kind of relationship yeah i couldn't really tell what she did and so i created a new website and it's really co-creating because it's a collaboration and really finding out taking a deep dive into who that person is how they serve people and the thing was is that she had a new book that was coming out and we put that book front and center so people knew that she was an author they were able to find the book download her media kit find out where she was doing speaking engagements on her book tour and all of that stuff and figure out too that she is a coach and So that's what I really, you know, I love doing that. And um, it's, it's great to be able to serve those clients. Sure. Especially with business coaches. Like there's a lot of them. I mean, I, I've run into a lot of them and it's okay. Why are you different? Like that's, that's so important to know. Okay. Why are you different? What's your deal? Huh? Um, What else was I going to say? Yeah. I'm going to connect you with a couple people after the show, web hosts and that sort of thing. And, and, uh, and that'll be yeah. What and and side note hey. that that's cool that you're from Cincinnati. I I do another podcast. It's a comedy podcast with one of my buddies who grew up here but escaped and went to what he calls the relative Shangri La of Dayton, Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> so if if he calls Dayton a Shangri La, that tells you what it's like here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah, yeah. It's, it's called flyover plates and it's just us comparing the foods between ohio and new york and just you know being very snarky and yeah so it's vastly different and for for those people who are listening dayton's about 45 minutes from cincinnati cincinnati's a much bigger city that's where you got that river walk right yeah. The, yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really cool, and it's just grown since I left there. It's like just grown, and it's really, um, it's it's really nice. It's nice to visit. Nice. Um, we're going to do an article now. If you are, if you are ready, <clears throat> this is an I'm article ready. I did years ago on my prior talk show, and it is just something that's so, so important. Uh, Gizmodo.com did this one um, in August of 17, actually. 
And this is something that I wish all computer guys would know. Because believe it or not, unfortunately, most computer guys don't keep up on their training. You get a dude here, and even if you train him tomorrow at the big box store, they're training him using 1991 methodology. It's insane. So a lot of them are still out there telling you, you have to have a complex password, and you have to have a strong password. It turns out all of it is fake. Um, and even if, regardless of when you were trained or anything like that, it's I have this thing... It's called Logic, and none of these guys... <laughs> I've heard of that. Yeah, you've heard of it too good. So <laughs> if, if I told you that bad guys don't sit in front of your computer and, and attempt to break into your whatever account you're doing, side note, even if they did do that, they, they'll get kicked out after three times. They'll get locked out, and the whole thing, will, you know, sirens will go off anyway. So bad guys, first of all, are very lazy. Second of all, if they try to break into your account three times, they'll get locked out. Um, they are not going after your individual accounts. So having a long, difficult password that's hard to guess is totally pointless, right? I mean, having a password that's hard to guess, that's fine like in middle school when you're in the computer lab and you don't want your friends to guess your password. But other than that, it's just insanely terrifying to the clients, right? Most of my clients are, are seniors who don't love technology and they're otherwise intelligent, successful people, but they just, they can't stand this this intimidation of, of the tech world. So all a complicated password can serve to do is to, to intimidate the consumer and terrify the consumer. It can never, ever, 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 ever protect you against anything. Uh, it turns out that the bad guys actually walk in the back door of a company. If that company is infected with a Microsoft server, they'll just walk right in and take everything. It's like if you go to a car dealer and you take that little box off the wall that has all the keys in it, right? It's a lot easier to do that versus sitting there guessing an individual's account and only having three chances to do it. Huh. So the article here says, the guy who invented those annoying password rules now regrets wasting your time. And again, this came out in 2017, and most computer really? dudes have not even heard of it. None of them do that, and that, that's why most websites are still brutal, and, and they demand, you have to have five exclamation marks and two Cyrillic characters and a music note, because they don't understand how passwords work. It's quite frustrating when you actually do know what's going on and when you have logic. <clears throat> so... We've all been forced to do it. A password with at least so many characters, so many numbers, so many special characters, and maybe an uppercase letter. Guess what? The guy who invented these standards nearly 15 years ago now admits they're basically useless. He is also very sorry. The man in question is Bill Burr, not the comedian, um, who worked for the NIST. In 2003, Burr drafted an eight-page guide on how to create secure passwords creatively called the NIT Special Publication 800-63. This became the document that would go on to more or less dictate password requirements on everything from email accounts to logins to online banking. All those rules about using uppercase letters and special characters and numbers, those are all because of him. The only problem is he really didn't know what he was doing and he didn't know how passwords worked back when he wrote the manual. He certainly wasn't a security expert. And now the retired 72-year-old bureaucrat wants to apologize. Much of what I did I now regret, he told Wall Street Journal. Admitting his research into passwords came from, came from a white paper in the 80s before the web was invented. Uh, and what did I say, right? In, you know, in middle school, yeah, you want a password that's hard for your friends to guess. But that's really, yeah. And he that's says, crazy. Right, right. And he says, in the end, the list of guidelines was too complicated for a lot of folks. And the truth is, it was barking up the wrong tree. Um, there's a there's an XKCD comic that shows four simple words create a passphrase that would take five, a computer 550 years to guess, while a nonsensical string of random characters would only take three days. Hang on a second. Whoa. <clears throat> I gotta read that again. So there was a comic called XKCD. It's a tech nerd comic if you've ever read it. And they actually explain mathematically how a nonsensical string of characters, random letters and numbers and ampersands and whatever else these jokers want okay. you to use, right, would only take a computer three days to guess. And again, none of it is ever even, you know, they say, oh, what about a brute force, right? You always hear these dudes with suspenders and beards. Yeah, but what about brute force? No one's doing brute force. Okay, you'd guess your password three times. 
And and they I had the other day I tried to get into my bank and I like the people there, but I I did two wrong guesses. So I said, all right, let me go home and wait till I, you know, I'll I'll try again. And I got home and it said I have one guest left and they still attacked when I did the correct pass where they attacked and shut it down. And again, sirens went off and the whole universe flipped out. And and it was just the what I'm saying is all of this can only punish the consumer. Right. It infuriated me. I knew there was no bad guys. Right. So anyway, if you use a pass phrase instead, right, for random coherent words, which would be a lot easier for people to remember, um, it would actually take a computer 550 years to guess it. So it's a lot safer. I like that idea. Um, you don't know how many clients I have, you probably do, um, worked with who they didn't have their um, login for their website, or their domain name, which were with two separate companies and all kinds of... Oh, two, three, four, like, five vendors. And I mean, 99% yes. is my estimate. 99% of companies <laughs> have no idea what their password is or maybe even who their vendor is for their website. That's where security starts, folks. Yeah, yeah. And I, you know, on top of it, when you were saying all this, I was thinking, okay, so I, I design a lot of WordPress websites. That's the main platform that I've been using to design websites for about 12 years. And I have been using the, uh, where they create an automated password that does have all those characters, numbers, and letters in it for sites. So it sounds like from what you're saying, just change it to something else that's kind of more passphrase oriented. Yeah, I got a couple points there. Number one, no matter what, folks, please write your passwords on a real dead tree, a real piece of paper, right? So it's yours, it's in your hand, and nobody can touch it. Um, so, you know, regardless of whether or not it's memorable, right, especially the ones that may, you have to change it every 30 days, and no, just write it down. Um, <clears throat> as far as those those um suggested passwords that's actually the worst thing in the universe so you have firefox and chrome and everybody else now is safari and you have a suggested password right and they come up with a string of like 490 characters right so <laughs> two things are going to happen here and neither of them is good okay number one again it doesn't protect you against bad guys because bad guys you know even a computer if it had to randomly guess would only take three days or the bad guy, again, is just walking through the back door at the company, and he doesn't care how long that password is or how complicated it is. He's just doing copy and paste. He, he takes your password, copy and paste, done. Um, however, the side effect is, here's, here's the two things that aren't good. Uh, either you reformat your computer and you lose all those saved passwords that Chrome, Firefox, Safari offer to generate for you, okay? Or... It, they get sucked into your Google Cloud account or your Apple account, and then you forget those. And Apple and Google are excellent at punishing people and locking them out of their accounts. And the whole idea there is that it takes control away from you. Now, Apple and Google control your life. They control your website, or it's totally gone. Either way, you no longer have control. What if your car dealer said, you know what? You don't need that key for your car. You might lose it. Why don't I keep it for you? And then you can't use your car. Hello. Uh, so it, it's be careful because computers aren't fun anymore. You know, when you and I started in the 90s in this industry, it was fun. It was hopeful. But in, in my opinion, it's now all about control. Um, so remember, folks, these are your websites. Don't let Google and Apple suggest things in order to control you. Um, what, uh, yeah, what do you think so far? I'll, I'll finish the, the article later. Those are some uh, really good insights, Mark, about the control aspect. I hadn't really thought about it, but what you're saying is right. And it was fun in the earlier days when people were calling the web, the, you know, the web, like the wild west, but there were all these interesting and new technologies and everything was new. I remember it was probably around was it 95 or 96 was, uh, an app that was, it was called Future Splash, and it became Flash, which was bought by Macromedia, which was bought by Adobe and killed by them pretty much. But it was a really fun 
way to create websites because you could do all these fun animations and everything. And I, I loved it as a tool, but then over time it got more complicated and you really had to be a programmer above my level to use it. And aside from the fact that it wasn't good for SEO and being found by the web, that's why I had to switch over from it. Um, you know, there were a lot of fun things that happened then. There was a lot of new technology and uh, yeah, the password issues were definitely not as prevalent as they are today. I did want to ask you something really quick. So say you keep um, a document or documents on your Google Cloud or Apple Cloud or whatever cloud system that you use because you want to keep them in a, what you think of as a safe place. What What would you advise on that? Great question. Uh, just kiss them goodbye. <laughs> um, a couple Bye. of things. Nothing in the cloud, in my opinion, is ever fully safe, right? Just like Jesus said, your your gold and your clothing, your, are they're all going to get bitten by moths at some point. Um, so I personally keep everything locally. And then I just do real proper local backups and I keep them offsite in different my office and my parents' house and whatever. <clears throat> if you do need some cloud stuff, um, definitely I recommend not Apple and Google. Uh, that would be the way to go. Um, first of all, um, all the underdogs are always going to be safer and they're going to treat you with more respect. If you go to, there's a Reddit forum just for Gmail users, and at least once a day you get someone saying, hey, I trusted my life to my Gmail, to, to Google, and I put all my, saved all my passwords, I did everything they said, I have all my documents, and of course all my email, and then they just said, sorry, too bad, you can't log in anymore because sorry, too bad. And there is absolutely no way to ever talk to anybody ever again, you lose everything. These cloud companies, the big tech ones, they have disdain for you and they don't like you. On top of that, it turns out 99% of people using the cloud for files had no idea they were they were using it. People have no idea. Um, I, I do a lot of uh, speeches about the OneDrive scandal where, you know, if you willingly sign up for OneDrive, that's fine. But 99% of the people involved in it have no idea that they're involved in it. Wow. That's... Uh... Amazing and horrible at the same time. I mean, the things the things that you find out. Wow. Yeah. It, when you buy a new computer, Microsoft begs you viciously to sign into the OneDrive scandal, and but you don't know it, right? There's no you just there's no way out of it, and you don't understand what they're doing. They just beg you. You need a Microsoft account, otherwise your life is not complete. And with Windows 11, you're not allowed to protect yourself from that. So I'm one of like four people in the world who, who can protect you from it. I just I don't turn on your computer until I get there. Okay, I turn it on. I do a lot of bypassing, and it protects you from the OneDrive scandal. You know, again, so if you if you willingly want to use the cloud, sure, great, go ahead. My personal favorite is iDrive.com. It's a third party. They're underdogs. They treat you with respect. I have a little referral link on my recommendations page on my website and they give me a dollar if you sign up but whatever the point is don't use the others but i, I like iDrive because they actually respect you um and they have both backup as well as cloud synchronization dropbox used to be okay but just like you were saying before and and that was cool i didn't know the origins of flash i knew it was just called i knew it was macromedia flash but i didn't know it was originally called future splash that's so cool and they did i mean they certainly did a lot to to make the web what it is yeah it was an independent company that was bought by macromedia that's cool so yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of really interesting, like I said, fun things that were happening. But yeah, technology, it definitely changes and not necessarily for the better, as we have both uh, found out. I mean, there's some great things it can do, but then there's some horrible things as well. I mean, it's just like the whole sort of, um, I don't know if battle is the battle of AI going on right now. You can do some interesting things with it that by the same token some very damaging things or just totally i mean you know when it comes to things like design creativity writing art all of those things right now ai can do those and it's like where is that you know i mean we can kind of see where it's where it's headed and uh yeah it's it's a little bit uh i'm not gonna say scary but it's it's highly questionable as to it coming out for the greater good. I mean, it's easy enough. I, the other day I was um, 
sending out an email newsletter and I needed a subject line. So I wrote in a few things. I got a subject line out of it. And I'm like, oh, okay, this is kind of cool. You know, I could see I see where you can do things like that, um, which is great to have it as a little tool, but there are other people that are doing a lot more things with it that could uh, end up being damaging. I guess that's the best way to say it. And And to your point about how you know, with Flash, right? And it grew into Adobe and then it got overgrown and it became unmanageable, right? It's, it's, that's the same thing with, I was going to say it with Dropbox, right? I used to like Dropbox, but then they became overgrown. And now whenever you plug in a thumb drive, they pounce on you desperately and they suck all the contents out of the thumb drive and they're, they take over your machine and they suck everything. I mean, this is stuff that, that would have been called out as malware 10 years ago. And now they're just getting away with it. And you, well, you agreed to it. Well, no, I didn't know why you clicked agree. Uh, so really it's, in my opinion too, this AI stuff is like the next level. First you have technology, it sort of works, it's sort of fun. Then you have the overgrown garbage that oversteps its bounds. And now you have this AI. All of this stuff is made by the same people who have no personal self-control. That's really, that's what it boils down to. And unfortunately we're on the receiving end of all of this. And it's just going to get weirder and weirder and weirder unless we stop and say, Hey, wait a minute. That's, and they say this in the book, why software sucks. It's wait a minute. Just because you sh you can doesn't mean you should. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that also reminds me, since you mentioned Dropbox, um, that I think, you know, back in the, uh, we'll just say Snow because of Snowden and um, Julian Assange, I think Dropbox is one of the companies that said they would give private information to the NSA if they thought you were I don't know, suspicious or something. And yeah. so I immediately felt suspicious of them. And I, I rarely use Dropbox. That's a really good point. Yeah. I always go for the underdogs nowadays. And actually with iDrive, they have a, they have a feature where if you sign up for them, I mean, I use the default key, they call it a default key, but if you really wanted to, you could create your own key and you better guard that with your life because if you lose that key, nobody can ever, like, they can't see it at that point. So if you have something extra secret and you create your own key your, uh, with, with yourself and then not even iDrive could ever see what's in your stuff ever. So even if they wanted to give it out to any authority, they can't. Wow. Yeah. For sharing that. That's that's good to know. I'm going to check them out. Yeah, I sure. wouldn't do that for my beginner users, of course, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's so to finish the article, they just said the latest set of NIST guidelines recommends that you create a long passphrase rather than the gobbledygook words and the, the random letters and numbers. Unfortunately, though, in my opinion, jokers that are at these computer stores and jokers who, is in, who are in charge of bank websites won't ever bother reading the new because they none of them update their training you know they still think viruses happen and they still think floppy disks are the way to go uh so that's that um and this organization you call you said n-a-s-t what n-i-s-t um oh, I, yeah yeah it's the it's federal government of the u.s i think it's national institution of standards and uh hang on i'll tell you in a second standards and technology that's what it is and they do well, a lot Based on uh, the the apology tour that you just mentioned, that's why the government has gotten hacked. I mean, just look at it there. They're using these really ancient uh, methods there that don't work. And just the whole idea that somebody can uh, just, uh, you know, with all these data breaches, just take everybody's data. I mean, thousands, if not millions of people's data has yeah. been stolen from some of the from some of them my data was affected and it's like oh here we'll give you three years free of some kind of thing that will some program that will let you know if you've been hacked or whatever or here you can have thirty dollars you know right. they have thirty dollars right and, and unfortunately like the, three it might be three i could be wrong on that <laughs> and that's the deal with with cybersecurity insurance right they can never actually fix the problem it's just here sorry have money or here sorry have monitoring whatever 
Um, and that's that's why I always talk about prevention and actually setting up the technology so it actually protects you because this it, it's sorry too bad, right? There's nothing we could do about it. Here's some money. It's <clears throat> sure. So it's I mean it's like it's like a car accident or something. It's like sorry, we can't fix you. Here's money. Um, what was I going to say about that? That's yeah, and that's a whole other. I've done episodes before on on preventing ransomware, and I'm one of six people in the world who know how to prevent it to begin with, instead of just here, let's have an insurance policy. It's it's nuts. Yeah, what else were we gonna say about that? That was oh right. If you and again these dudes right, they they keep coming up with more and more and more and more and more and more schemes. None of it actually protects these big organizations from data breaches, does it? It just serves to hassle us. And their only solution is add more complexity, right? You ever talk to someone and and it's it's always just oh add more complexity instead of finding something like the passphrase thing. It's simple and it's safer. So that's what that's what we try to do here on the Computer Exorcist podcast: simple and safer. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. And I was wondering, Mark, if it was okay if I can offer two free gifts for your audience today. Sure, go ahead. So so, uh, the first one is a free gift that you can download from my website, jagmedia.net. It's an ebook on it's an ebook on 10 tips to increase your online visibility. So this covers uh, your website, your social media, email, your brand, and you can download that at jagmedia.net. Uh, that's the first gift. And then the second gift is you can join my private Facebook design and branding group where you can learn tips about design and branding and a whole lot more. So I'm just going to say it first, but if you search for a group called JAG Media Branding, that will be the easiest way to find it. So it's uh, facebook.com slash groups slash JAG Media Branding. And uh, look forward to uh, helping your audience out with any of their design needs that they have. Great. And you reminded me, I should probably plug my own ebook. (laughs) Uh, It's called How to Protect Yourself from Your Computer. And if you go to becomeanexorcist.com, you can get it, you can buy the paperback or you can have it as an ebook download on that page. Um, So becomeanexorcist.com. So Janet, um, I think it was a great episode. Thanks so much for being here. You are welcome, Mark. Thanks for inviting me. Really appreciate it. And thanks so much, folks. We'll talk to you all next week and tell your friends about the show.